All right. Good evening. It's not the morning. It's definitely not the morning. So just a few things before we get into the sermon. I want to mention, you may notice there's uh, a few empty pews today. Uh, we actually have 50 of our, our young leaders, our CARP leaders particularly, who are in Vegas right now. And they're, yes, you can give them a round of applause too. Um, yeah, they're there for what they're calling a spiritual workshop. They've been doing this almost every season, and they gather all, everybody together and have an amazing experience there. So we're praying for them. They come back tomorrow night, so uh, we'll look forward to seeing them again and hearing their inspiration. Just a few announcements that are coming up. Uh, many of you know Yaiko-san, Yaiko Echevarria. Uh, she is having her sunghua. We're having her sunghua on the 7th. April 7th at 9.30 a.m. That's a Friday. It's at the Forest Lawn of Covina. So please, if you're able to make it, please join us there and honor Yaiko-san's life. And the day after, we have Special Grace. So Special Grace is taking place here. Uh, anyway, for now, it's here. And it's going to be at, on the 8th at 11 a.m. This is the first date. There's going to be a future date. We don't know the exact date yet. We're still working it out with Reverend Thompson, but if you're part of Special Grace, please look out for that. Okay, and we will also have a, some form of registration that will go out so that we know exactly who's coming on that day to be prepared. <laughs> we'll, we'll work on that. Uh, we'll work on getting that out. Amen? Achoo. Okay, so for today, you know, we've been kind of going through Abraham's family. And actually, today and tomorrow, we're going to conclude... That, uh, that whole kind of segment of where we've been kind of spending time and understanding. And I hope, did everyone do the homework? Did anyone read Abraham's family? Did anyone have some deep inspiration from it? Okay, I'm glad some people did. Um, and, you know, this is why we're doing this, of course, is that uh, Mother Moon, our true mother, founder of our, organ co-founder of our organization, Family Federation, asked all of our leaders to sit down and study Abraham's family. That was the lecture that she provided along with a lecture about the Chonshimwan, the prayer hall over in Vegas. So I find that to be very significant and a lot of deep inspiration came out of my own personal study and that's what I'm sharing. So today and tomorrow, today is going to be about Abraham and Isaac and tomorrow we'll talk about Jacob and Esau. So you can look forward to that. If you're a fanatic, you can come tomorrow too. So I actually want to start with a, you know, my experience, you know, Abraham and Isaac is a story about a dad and his son. Of course, it's, it's really fundamentally a story about a dad and his son. And my, ex my relationship with my dad, I think, is very, quite good. Uh, we've had our rocky moments, you know, <laughs> as every son does with their father. And one of the things that I, you know, I really distasted, almost hated growing up with my dad was my dad's a handyman. And he's always working in his little bench that he has in his garage. He, he fixes everything. This guy, this guy can fix the world if you gave him a chance. You know? <laughs> he, he's, he's always working with something, and he's fixing something in the house that doesn't need to be fixed. You know? Just doing that kind of thing, breaking it, then fixing it again. Um, and my dad's amazing in that regard. He, I, I always, we call him the, the walking encyclopedia. Because uh, he just knows everything. He just knows how to do everything. I don't know how he does and he'd always try to teach me how to do these things. And so growing up, he'd drag me out into the back, you know, <laughs> like, here's how you throw, you know, unscrew something. Here's how you build something. And I'd get so frustrated. And to the point where I would try to avoid my, my father, like straight up avoid him. And, it, you know, that's actually kind of a bad thing, you know. Like, I would try to avoid those moments with my dad. Some of the dads here can relate. They're like, man, that hurts. <laughs> my son is like that. Um, and I had this breakthrough moment, though, when I was at One Heart Camp, which, by the way, One Heart Camp is happening again this year at Camp Sealy again. Yes, it's back. So please, any middle schooler, high schooler, look out for that. It's, it's really an amazing way to invest into our young people. So my first kind of experience of breakthrough, like my life, was sixth grade. I was at One Heart Camp, and they do this 21-minute prayer. Some of you remember that. Yeah, at the very end, you know, they build it up. You sing all these songs. And, and then you go into this 21-minute prayer. And I remember in that prayer, I, was, I just started crying. And I was like, like, 
curled up. You know when you're crying and you just can't control your body? And I was just curled up crying. And I, I wasn't crying about God. <laughs> you know, they did all this build up probably to help me have a breakthrough with God. And what I was crying about was my dad. I'd gone my whole life trying to avoid him. This is sixth grade Joshua talking about how I went my whole life, you know, <laughs> avoiding my dad. <laughs> and, and, and it was like, it, it was like a moment of liberation for me. And I, I made a commitment. I was like, okay, I'm going to spend more time with my dad. Whenever he asks me to build something with him or whatever, teach me, I'm going to do it. I didn't actually do that. You know, I, I went back on my promise. But, you know, that kind of built into a moment, a really special moment with my dad. And that was... Does anyone know what Science Olympiad is? No one knows. Okay, so my school would do this science competition with all the other schools in Southern California. And one of the competitions was trajectory, where you had to build a catapult, and you, had, and, and you would shoot it, and you had, like, parameters of a box to build it in, and you would come to it, and it would, whoever won would be the one that's most accurate uh, catapult to build. And so I ended up in Science Olympiad probably for selfish reasons, I wanted to get some kind of uh, certification for something. And that was in middle school. And um, my dad was like, why don't you try trajectory? Why don't you try this? It would be fun. You don't, you know, you don't like the other things. So, <laughs> uh, And so we started to work on this thing together. We started to build it and uh, build this catapult and test it. We spent hours. We actually still have it. It's up, it's up in our garage, hanging up, uh, our catapult that we built together. And it was an amazing half-year process where we just were spending time working out the kinks, making it a little better, making it more accurate, improving it. And my dad, like, broke the system. He broke, like, he figured out a way of building a bigger catapult than anyone else could make it uh, within the parameters of the rules. And they questioned us at the competition. They said, you can't have a big catapult like that. And he proved them wrong. And it was this really awesome moment between my dad and I. And... Actually, what ended up happening is as we were working together on it, uh, we, it started to be really good, this catapult. And I started to get really excited about uh, building this thing. I didn't know I'd ever be excited about building anything. Uh, it, and, and what ended up happening was at the final competition, we got first place. Yeah. And it was, uh, it was really a proud moment for my, my, my dad and I. Because honestly speaking, he designed the whole thing. <laughs> he just told me what to do. You know, he was the one that was really invested into it. But I found this experience where my dad and I were working together on something. And it was victorious. But it felt good. I felt like what I'd been crying about, I was able to finally see what it was that God wanted between my dad and I. And, and I feel like since that moment, there's always been a sense of fondness, a sense of oneness. Uh, you know, we have our ups and downs, but my dad and I, in a way, we made our offering together. We made our offering. And it was, it was such a simple thing. So in a sense, it's like you don't know. I don't know how much my dad knew how important that moment was for me. I don't think he knew. I probably, this is the first time he's heard it. But that moment mattered. As a kid, that was, my, that was my time to be one with my dad. And I felt loved. And, and I know God was so happy. So happy. So when we study Abraham and Isaac, it's really a story about a father and son making their offering together. That's where I want to land. It's a little bit different. Usually when you talk about Abraham, you talk about how he has to offer his Isaac and offer the one he loves the most. But really, at the end of it all, they offer it together. It's a beautiful thing that God creates, this situation. So I want to read the story. So if you have a Bible, you can open it up. We're going to read a, quite a bit. We're going to read Genesis 22, 1 to 18. So just read with me and imagine yourself in their situation as we read together. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take your son and your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. 
And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young son, let me read from here, said to his young, his young son, okay, I can't read from there, <laughs> stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. He took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them together, and Isaac said to his father, Abraham, to his father Abraham, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. He said, behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they both went, uh, so they went, both of them together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God seeing you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in the thicket by his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And lastly, and the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand uh, that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. That is God's word in the Bible. That's a, every, I'm sure most people know this story, right? Most people have read it many, many times. This is an incredible story about the sacrifice of Isaac. And the context of it is, it is, of course, Abraham fails to cut the dove, which we talked about last week. And because of that, God requires him to go to Abimelech and re, re, reorder his faith. And then he asks him to sacrifice his son. This, of course, from our true parents' teaching is more than just a simple moment. This is a moment where a father is asked to give his only son. And this is a son that God blesses him with. He's 100 years old when he gets his son, Isaac. And so the fact that he then has to sacrifice it is... Wow, is the highest sacrifice that one could possibly give to the point of almost like Abraham's taking his own life as a sacrifice. But nonetheless, he, 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 makes, he makes that sacrifice. He goes, and then God says, now I understand. You fear God. You, you, you have faith. I trust you. And that is the victory. So in the offering of Isaac... Actually, what I want to read is now a, a word from our true parents. And this is True Mother's words from October 15th. And particularly, she's talking about the next generation in these two words that I'm going to show. I think they're very powerful. So she says this. You are truly blessed people. Father began at the age of 40. You are also celebrating 40 years since you received the blessing. I pray that your families can begin anew. Become the noble central families of Chonilguk by successfully raising your second and third generation into healthy wheat. She says on April 30th, many proclamations have been made, but now we need to reap actual fruit in the era of completion. And we must make this into a place where that fruit is harvested. The Family Federation and the Youth Federation should unite centering on Chonshimwan, Garden of God's Hope, internal training, and move forward together as elder and younger brothers. They need 
to go forward in unity. Let's give a round of applause to our true mother, true parents. What a powerful, a powerful statement requesting that the older and the younger come into unity. And so the baseline is this, is that our offering in this age, I'll be honest, it may not have been the age of the past, but the age of the present is this. The offering is made intergenerationally. Does that make sense? The offering is made intergenerationally. It's not just me, but it's also my children. It's the first and the second and the third generations together. It's offered intergenerationally. An intergenerational faith, which is what Abraham and Isaac had, intergenerational faith redeems past mistakes and guides future victories, both providentially and practically. So intergenerational unity is practical and also providential. On the practical end, it's very simply, it's inheritance and edification. So edification is one's being able to change the way that they're living or the way that they're living, uh, guiding their life. And so it's practical in the sense that you gain wisdom from your elders. I gained so much wisdom. I'm amazed, Uncle Nasser, that you're here. You just had surgery. Oh, my gosh. Oh, wow. <laughs> we need to pray for you. But I, I gained that wisdom. I gained that same wisdom from Reverend Masaru Tengan. Reverend Tengen is a provider of that wisdom. It's a practical thing for me to be in unity with Reverend Tengen. You know, when I hear the stories of, uh, of Boonville from, from Uncle Rick, those are important stories. Oh my goodness, those testimonies matter. I remember the day, do you, I don't know if you remember, but we were singing one of those songs from your spiritual son in the, in the, in the room at Naoko-san's house. And we're just singing one of those songs about, about a man who's just trying to find his way to the chosen people. And do you remember the song? First Days. And Jermaine was crying his eyes out. Oh, thank you so much. Jermaine was crying his eyes out because he knew that the essence of that song was a man trying to find the right way, the right path, the way that God designed. Now, if we didn't have that story, if we didn't have that experience, if we didn't have those songs, we wouldn't have had that experience. So the offering is made intergenerationally because it practically guides us. It guides us forward. And it also helps us to not make the same mistakes of the past. Gosh, we don't want to make the same mistakes. Do you want to make? I don't want to make the same mistakes. And so I need to understand the mistakes that you made. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> I need to know what, what went wrong. Don't just tell me the good things. Tell me what went wrong so that I may understand how to navigate forward right now. I am young. I am so young. I have so much to receive. It just practically makes sense for me to receive the wisdom of elders. Amen? Everyone has an elder, you know, so we're always receiving wisdom from somebody. So it's not just me. <laughs> we're all there. But it's also providential. And providence by definition, is God's guiding direction. It's God's plan. God's providence, God's plan. And it requires intergenerational unity. It requires it. Throughout history, when an offering is left unfulfilled, when an offering is left unfulfilled, a condition, a, 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 a responsibility is left unfulfilled, where does that offering go? Who has to carry the responsibility? The descendant, especially of the chosen people, because God works through chosen people. Do you believe you're chosen? Everyone's hand should be raised. You're so chosen to be here right now. And so God is working through you. And if an offering is left unfulfilled, providentially, God has no choice but to work with your descendant. It's always been the case. And that works on a community level and also a faith level. Another example is Father Moon. When Father Moon was arriving where, in Korea and becoming known, he expected that Christianity, the foundation of Christianity in Korea, would receive him. That was the whole plan. There was people that he felt were prepared to receive him and even testified to him, but then turned their backs later or couldn't respond to the call. That was first-generational Christianity that was supposed to receive 
true parents. Supposed to help them and elevate them. We call that a John the Baptist, right? And so what happens? Did they? Did they receive Father and Mother Moon at that time? Absolutely not. The exact opposite. They threw him in jail. They were reason for his suffering. They caused that to take place on many accounts. And of course, that breaks Father and Mother Moon's heart, who knows that this is, this is the providential responsibility, the offering of the first generation Christianity in Korea. So what do they do? If that, that, that generation couldn't fulfill that offering, where did it go? It went to second generation Christianity at Awa Women's University and Yonsei University. So immediately after that, they had to translate to the next generation where they had these younger Christian brothers and sisters who were growing up in university students, and they started to seek them. And that was supposed to be where the breakthrough was supposed to take place. Do you know this history? Most of you know it. This was, this was God's design. God, throughout providential history, relies on the descendants if the offering is not fulfilled. So providentially, that unity is necessary. It's necessary. And of course, Ewan Women's University, Yonsei University, didn't work out. And where did, after that moment, where did Father Moon have to go? He had to go to North Korea, and then eventually, to restore back Korean Christianity, he came to America. And so Father Moon's, Mother Moon's responsibility was to restore American Christianity so that they could fix those problems. And that is what we call a prolongation. We know this word <laughs> from the divine principle, a prolongation of the providence. Could have happened sooner, but there was a prolongation. So that's, that's, how, that's how we understand it both practically and providentially. So I want to take a moment and look at both Abraham's offering and then Isaac's offering and their unity together. So the first is Abraham's faith. This was his offering. That one, he trusts God. God gives him a direct command. What does God command him to do? Offer his son. And so he offers Isaac. And Abraham's faith in this moment, from the divine principle says, Abraham's faith was absolute in obedience to God's command. He was about to kill Isaac, his only son, intending to offer him as a burnt offering. With absolute faith, absolute obedience and absolute loyalty he lifted him up to the position of already having killed Isaac it was as if Abraham had already sacrificed his son he completely separated his son from Satan he placed his son on an altar it took him three days to climb Mount Moriah I as I understand you know it, it, it shouldn't have taken that long um, but it took him three years as a purifying but also it's a painful climb this is a man who's, and, and back in those traditions, to not have a son is, is a painful thing to bear. He didn't have, he had no son. He was given and blessed a son. This is the most precious thing for his heritage. And he has to offer him. In Father Moon's word, he says that Abraham's heart went beyond reality. Abraham's heart transcended reality. If you can imagine yourself in the position like that, or if you don't have a child, imagine the most precious thing for you in your life. And you, you're being asked to make this kind of choice of faith. You're going to go crazy. Absolutely crazy. And, 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 and Abraham goes there. He, go, he has to have gone there. He's, just, he's a father. And so his heart goes even beyond reality fully in obedience to the direction of God. He searched, and the divine principle also says, Abraham searched for the place where his heart and his son's heart could bear fruit in oneness, so that he may again inherit the will of God. That was Abraham's faith, an incredible faith. And that's the father's generation. They hold this level of faith. And when I look at it, I see myself in the Isaac generation, or some people say the Joshua generation. <laughs> I don't like saying the Joshua generation because it just feels weird. It's, 
feels weird. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> but I'm in this Isaac generation, and I look at my parents' faith, or I look at the people I respect, you know, those people that just have tremendous, tremendous faith. And I just, I, all I can do is, like, kind of bow myself to it. You know, I, I, I always testify to my dad. Actually, maybe I can't do it. Uh, but my dad works so hard. This man works so hard. You know, he's working true all foods job with AJ, <laughs> AJ son. And, you know, he's there. He's up at 2.30 a.m. I'm sorry, dad. Let me testify. This is my job. This is my responsibility to testify. So, you know, my dad sees up at 2.30 a.m. He joins East Coast morning devotion. You know, <laughs> this guy's crazy. And then he's at work at 4.35. He's working until 3, you know, 2, 3 p.m. He's back home by 5. And then my mom's waiting there, ready to go witnessing with him, you know. And then she's like, let's go. So then they go out witnessing at the campus when he's like, you know, and I, I can imagine my dad's just like in a daze. He's just worked all day, and now he's out there on the, uh, on the college campuses witnessing the students, investing and pouring out his heart, comes back, has a great meal. My mom's awesome. Has a great meal. And then for his, for in the evening time, you know, what he started to do recently is he's studying Spanish and Korean on his phone using that, what's that app called? Du, Duolingo? He's triolingo. <laughs> he's doing two languages. Uh, it, 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 you know, like, and, and then on the weekends, he's here at church. He's singing, and then he's out there at church outreach, you know, on Sundays. I look at my dad, and I just... He's trusting God, and he's offering. He's offering his Isaac all the time. And our true parents are exactly that same way, constantly offering. They're just trusting God and offering it, offering, offering. How much time would, you know, you... Yeah, my true mother says, all I want to do is roll around and tell old stories with my grandchildren. But I want, I want to ask you, honestly, do you think she has time for that? Do you think she's afforded that kind of time? The amount of expectation that's on her from God, true father? Gosh, and that's you, that's you as well. Every, every elder that's here, I bow to your faith. I bow to your trust. How much you've offered your Isaac time and time and time again. But Abraham is clear. He's offering his Isaac so that he could arrive at a oneness with him. That's the offering. Abraham is clear. I know my son understands what's going on. My son's not dumb. He's old enough to carry wood. We understand this. He's old enough to carry wood. He knows there's no offering. He's seen this tradition a hundred times. He knows he's the one. But he trusts. He's like, I'm going to go this path. And my prayer is that Isaac will understand. And that Isaac and I can find oneness. So then we get to Isaac. Who trusts his dad. He trusts God. But he also trusts his dad. And he chooses to offer his life. He, his dad is 100 years old. He lived to 170. So his dad, mathematically, was around 65 in our generation. He would be around 65 if you, you know, correlate the two. This young boy of 10, 12 years old could have ran away. He could have ran away. He had every ability to do so. But he trusts his dad. And he says, where's the lamb, dad? Where's the lamb? If Isaac had resisted, God would not have accepted the offer. Isaac demonstrated a faith that was equal to that of Abraham. Together their faith made the offering successful. And there was no way for Satan to retain his hold. Isaac inherited the divine mission from Abraham in that moment. And in the end, the beautiful thing, in the end, what do they do at the very end together? They offer the ram together. They offer the ram. 
He trusted his father. He honored his father. Now, it can seem pretty, pretty, pretty gruesome, this story. I don't think any of us are in this position anymore. Really, we're in a new age. But the essence of it is the same. Is they join together in the offering based on faith on both ends. Isaac demonstrated the same faith that Abraham demonstrated so that they could be in oneness. And so I really believe we're in a new age. I really believe. We're we're in an amazing age. You know, for 40, 40 plus years, 60 years, our elders walked the most suffering course possible to arrive where we're at now. And we stand on incredible foundation of faith. And now we're in the age of substance. And we have the opportunity. I have the blessing to co-pastor together with my wife. I'm not separated from her for seven years. I get to actually be with my wife and do this together with them. And with, with my family and with my children. So it's a new age. It's a beautiful age where we acknowledge and we understand the foundation we stand on. Incredible sacrifice. And so I, I want to read this, this passage from the divine principle that struck me so hard. I shared it with Reverend Tang in a few days ago. And, and this is why I really wanted you to read Abraham's family. I actually wanted you to find this particular passage. It's on page 216. And the divine principle, don't worry, you're not going to be able to find it in time. You can just hear it. It says, even though the dispensation through Abraham had failed and was prolonged through Isaac, as long as Isaac succeeded, Isaac's victory would become Abraham's own victory. Therefore, God would be able to regard Abraham as not having failed and the dispensation as not having been prolonged. We're in the age of the second and third generation. I think this is not just for this community, but in general, across the board. We also see this in Christianity taking place. The next generation of Christianity is standing up right now. We're seeing this also in most other religious communities, which is pretty much everybody in the world. A rising generation is emerging. It's a new age. And maybe the past wasn't perfect. And we acknowledge and we totally accept those things. We're humble to the realities of where we've come. But what this is saying in Abraham's model is that any mistake any challenge or any issue that we may have faced can be liberated through the next generation. So if we train and we raise and we cultivate the next generation, we can liberate the past. That's the beauty of what takes place in God's providence is that We can do it now. And anywhere we may have gone, anything that may have happened, we can liberate it through the generation that is called to rise now. But the key is that they have to rise. In our community, it hasn't taken place. To be honest, as the pastor of this church, it hasn't taken place. I have, you know, we still have a ways to go to raise them up, to cultivate them, to help them along their way, to be able to inherit your faith, to inherit your faith. My generation has not fully arrived there yet, but we have to. And we have to because the Abrahams of the world need to be able to rest and tell old stories with their grandchildren. They need to be liberated. That's our responsibility. So if anyone's my age or a little older, a little younger, that's our responsibility. And it's a tough thing to bear, but it's the most beautiful thing for the future. If we arrive there, if my generation does this right, everything will be sorted out. 
everything. That's what Mother Moon's promise is. And she's been reiterating and reiterating and reiterating. That's why I'm saying it, honestly. It's because that's what Mother Moon has been saying to us in so many of her speeches. She says, I'm I'm, going to work with this next generation. And she, she spent, when she came to America, she spent half the speech talking about honoring the first generation. And then she spent the other half of the speech talking about how we need to raise the next generation. It doesn't mean anyone's falling away or pushing anyone out. That's not the case. We stand on firm foundation and we need the wisdom. But my generation, we got to stand. And we have to help them to stand. We have to help them to stand. I feel like that's my responsibility. That's why I'm here. I, I, I mean, yeah. So we have to invest into that next generation. And I have a few ways that we can pull this off. I actually have a lot more than just what's on the screen. This one is for the Abraham generation. We have to invest into the next. We have to. So we, we have to open up our life and open up our ministry for inheritance. How many of the elders in here How many of you have written your memoir? Jose? Wow. Let's give him a round of applause. Open up your life. Your children may not value it now, but they will. They have to. You are the chosen people. And we're going to help you write your testimony. I'm working with Sam. I'm working with my brother and sister here. We're going to help you to write your testimony. Because the world needs to know. Your children need to know. So we open up our life. Those testimonies, those experiences, they matter. They deeply matter. They're the foundation we stand on. If we don't have it, we lose our culture. We lose everything. People need to know your story. And also ministry. Some of us are leaders of ministry or have a ministry. We got to involve the next generation. I remember the day that we sat down with Reverend Tang and asking if we could be a part of ACLC. And the doubt, (laughs) you know, he he questioned it. (laughs) I know he's the first to tell you. He's like, I questioned it. I didn't believe it. But when he did, it opened up everything. So there's opportunity for inheritance. We have to open up the doors. We have to. That's, to me, the a primary way we get there. Then second, invest, is that, I, I, guys, I'm very serious about this. Sunday school, high school and middle school Easter workshop. There's a high school and Easter, a high school and middle school Easter workshop coming up 21, 22, 23, April. And I, I really hope that those that you know that have high school and middle school students can come. Really, I hope they can come. Give them an opportunity to reconnect. We haven't done a workshop like this in three years. This is a really big deal. So Takayo and Mika and many others are investing into it, and it'll be at Pasadena House and also Sunday School. We invest by inviting them to come, have the experience with the other children. For the Isaac generation, my generation, we have to invest into Abraham's foundation. We have to help Abraham with the ram. We have to help Abraham make the offering. And the best way to do that is to invest into the foundation and volunteer. Do something. I have six things on this list that I, I, I need help with tomorrow. Audio and visual. I got Takuya up there. That's awesome. He's inheriting. Uh, you know, music. We have the music ministry here. We have food ministry. You have Sunday school, junction and workshop staff, construction. We're about to build the Chunshin Wan in the true parent's bedroom. We need help. <laughs> we need help. You want to learn how to build something? I, I didn't back in the day, but if you want to, you know, take this opportunity. Invest into the foundation. Then you can elevate your own heart. You elevate your own leadership, your own ability to serve and to give back. So this is just a very, it's a simple way to start. I'm not talking about CARP or you know, YCLC, you know, just start with volunteering with something. Invest into something. 
And trust me, we need help. We need support to build this up because we want to create an environment here where the next generation, whoever they may be, wherever they may come from, however long they've been gone, and when they walk into this space, into this community, they know and feel God's love. Amen? Haju, please join me in prayer. Beloved God, our heavenly parent, true parents in Jesus, we thank you. We ask that you can just find a place in our heart to reside as we digest that our offering in this age is intergenerational. It's the unity of Abraham and Isaac together. And it's that unity that allows your providence to move forward, that amazing things, miracles take place. God, I pray that we may be humble. God, to open up our life, open up our ministry, open up our willingness to serve and to be there the way that Isaac and Abraham were there for one another. Whatever our age, whatever our age, this is the time, God. I believe it. I really believe it. We'll create the environment here. And our beloved brothers and sisters, everybody who walks through will feel your love and know that they're cared for, know that they're loved, and their children too. So I offer this prayer. Ikido de chipok chun shim kajan. Joshua and Takaya homes ido mido poko de demio. Adio sam naida. Amen and achu. If you could turn to somebody next to you, and you have a moment of sharing with one another. Any inspiration?